Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Mark chapter 11. This is a bit of a difficult passage for many to comprehend because you read a passage like this and you think about Jesus cursing a tree when the tree clearly was not in season. You think about him clearing a temple when there was a lot of business and productivity going on in the temple. And one might wonder, what kind of reaction is Jesus displaying here? And people have issue with this. Like many people, many scholars have, have had issue with how Jesus has responded to these two things, the tree and the temple. And you and I look at this and think, is this really the righteous son of man, the savior of the world that came riding on a donkey? Is this the man right here that's displaying this kind of action? Is it, is it easy for us to justify this behavior? Reminds me of the dad who's sick and tired of his son. He's not working. He's not listening to mom. He's not doing any chores around the house. But what he is doing is he's playing video games all day. And dad gets fed up. And finally dad goes and takes the video games, throws them outside the lawn. And he turns on the what? The lawnmower. And he says, son, I'm doing this for you. And he runs over all of the video games. Parents, how many of you would like to do some, something like that maybe later this week? Um, and is there justification for this man? Is there justification for Jesus in what he does and the anger that he displays in a sense? And I want to look at two of these moments, the cursing the tree and the clearing the temple, and not just find its meaning, but perhaps how they, how they connect. Okay, so Mark 11, verse 12, let's read again. It says, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, in other words, this tree was full of leaves, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. And then he says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. My wife and I years ago got to visit Belize and we were traveling through the Belizean rainforest headed out to a river because we were going to go cave tubing. Has, has anybody ever done that before? Cave tubing? Man, that was just blowing my mind. It was wild. It was amazing. It was awesome. And on our way through this rainforest, we are hiking, you know, what seemed to be like two hours, thinking like we made the worst decision. Why are we doing this? The, the, our tour guide, who barely spoke any English, mustered up a couple of words and he said, fruit, eat. And he, he, he went on to point to all of us to tell us we should all pick from that tree and eat of that fruit. Now, I had read about many ways to die in a different country, and I did not think that that would be the way that we would go eating some fruit, getting poisoned by some man. What's, what's going to happen to us? Will my family ever hear from us? And so I made a wise decision, and I, I told my wife to pick from the fruit and eat of it. Because I've heard about a story where the woman eats it first, so you eat it first. And so we picked it, ate it, and it was absolutely delicious. It like changed my life. And I'm like, I got to find that tree. And still to this day, I have no idea what kind of fruit it was, no idea what kind of tree it was. If you're familiar with trees in the Belizean forest, please come by and tell me. But I still think about that fruit. And to, even to this day, I see fruit trees. And I'm like, oh, is there a, a nice juicy apple or something that I could just pick and eat? And every time I go to these apple trees, there's no apples because it's not season. And can I ask you a question? I go to an apple tree, you go to an apple tree and there's no apples because it's not in season. Is it the apple's fault? No. Now, would you and I go to that apple tree and say, I rebuke you, tree, for when I was hangry, I did not get any fruit from you because you did not produce it. Do we chop it down? Absolutely not. Jesus looks at this tree and does exactly that. Upset at the tree, curses the tree. For what did the tree not do? It did not bear any fruit. Now, Jesus approaches this fig tree to see if it had any fruit because of what he could see from a distance. We know that the tree um, has full of leaves. We know that the tree has no fruit, and we know that the tree is not in season to have any fruit, and Jesus goes up, now realizes that, and still curses it, and you got to be thinking like the disciples are saying, Jesus, this is not a very good look for you. This is not a good look for us. Why are we condemning trees when clearly it's not in season? I was reading the, our, our friend and our late friend Bob Morgan's obituary at his celebration of life service, and I learned that he was a certified 
arborists. And arborists are those who specialize in tree care. They cut trees down. They cut limbs down. They try to make sure it's growing right and healthy. Even fruit trees, you know, they make sure that they don't, some, some person says, hey, my fruit tree isn't producing fruits. It's only been a few months. I need you to come and give me a new tree, right? I mean, these people know that, well, there's not producing fruit for a reason, right? It takes some time. But Jesus looks at this tree, sees no fruit, and he says, we've got to chop it down. What's the issue that Jesus has with this particular fruit tree? Well, let me bring some understanding of my limited knowledge about fig trees, okay? So in the Middle East, there were different kinds of fig trees, and typically when there were leaves, there were also these little fruit-like nodules that were produced that many travelers would go up to. They would pick them, and they could eat them. It wasn't the fruit that it was producing, but it was a kind of fruit. So it, although it wasn't in season, there would be some type of fruit that you could pick. If you found a fig tree only with leaves and none of that kind of fruit, many came to the conclusion that there was something wrong with this fig tree. For when there are leaves and no fruits, there should always be some type of nodule thing that would be there. And the reason why Jesus shows up and he curses it because he goes there knowing that now it's not in season, doesn't see the nodules, doesn't see the fig fruit kind of like nature things and says, I must curse this because it's not doing its appointed job. If there was growth in a tree, appeared growth, Jesus sees it, the disciples see it, Jesus is a little angry, and he's like, I got to eat something. He goes over there, and as he gets closer to the tree, he realizes something, that the, the fig tree is not doing and not operating how it should be, regardless of what we see from a distance as you get a little bit closer and take a magnifying glass and you kind of look a little bit deeper into it, you start to find all the things that are wrong with it. Kind of like people you meet. I thought they were great, but when I showed up to their house, I realized how much of a slob they were. <laughs> on the outward, they had it going on. But when I got to the house, right, I was interested in that girl or that guy until I went on social media and I started finding not the pictures they were posting, but the pictures they were tagged in. Right? You start to do a little in-depth study about people, you can find out a lot, right? You start to look at trees from a distance, you think, that's a great tree, until you get a little bit closer. And you realize that what the tree was supposed to be doing, it was not doing. All there, there was growth. It was like a false growth. You can write this down. Improvement without evidence is a sign of decadence. And yes, I worked really hard to make sure that that rhymed for you. Improvement without evidence is a sign of decadence. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, if you're growing, but you're not producing, then you're actually decaying. From the distance, it appeared that this tree had it all going on. There was growth. Even though it was not in season, typically there would be some type of crop being produced from this. And yet, there isn't any evidence of it as you get closer. Jesus said the fig tree is not doing its appointed job. And because the fig tree is, is not doing the appointed job, it had to go. In fact, if you jump to verse 20, look at verse 20. Because the, the disciples passed by that tree the next day. And in verse 21, it says, Peter remembered, and he said to Jesus, he said, look, that fig tree you cursed has withered. Essentially, it's died. And Matthew, in his account, records this, and the disciples were amazed that a tree could go from having a lot of life, at least appearing to have a lot of life, to the next day being dead. By the way, this is the only miracle we find in the New Testament that Jesus actually brings about destruction to something. And so the, tree which, the, the, the fig tree, which appeared to have life, now not doing its job, Jesus curses it, and it withers away. Improvement without evidence is a sign of decadence. Now, aside from the Son of God, aside from the, the miracle worker man named Jesus, aside from being a rabbi, being a teacher, Jesus was also a prophet. And if you know anything about the Old Testament, you'll read stories of prophets doing some pretty strange and peculiar things. Things that, by the naked eye, aren't quite sure what it means. By the average listener or the uneducated person, you, you would hear these prophets speak and use symbolic language or everyday things, and you would be slightly confused until it is that the revelation from God is given to you, to you by God, and now your eyes are open and you see. There were some strange things that prophets would do. You think about the prophet Elijah, who ate from birds, had an axe head floating on the water, right? These are things that had great importance and significance to the people that he was talking to. You think about Ezekiel, who laid on his left side for 390 days on his left side, and he cooked his food 
using not animal dung, but human dung. And that's how he ate his food. All of this had symbolic, I don't know what kind of symbolic meaning that, that, that could have had if I was watching that, but that had some great meaning and great importance for what God was bringing to those people. Think about Isaiah, who walked around butt naked for three years. Now, we got to go back to that story, not today, and find out what God was doing with Isaiah and what kind of revelation he was bringing to the people at that time. But all of these prophetic symbolic acts often predicted future events. They were revealing the will of God, and as strange as they were, they would be done to persuade the people to open up their ears, to open up their eyes, and see that God is speaking through this individual and what he's using. Jesus is simply speaking to the people. And what is he using? This is an object lesson for his disciples. What is he using? He's using a tree. This was an object lesson. Jesus was giving a prophetic message regarding the nation of Israel. And as we read this and I explain this, I want you to know that this also applies to you and I. This was about the nation of Israel or anybody who claims to be of God, yet they do not bear any fruit. We probably know some people like that. They got the bumper stickers. They got the necklaces. They got the shirts. It appears from the outward that they got it all going on. Like they're a follower of God. But when you take the magnifying glass, when you get a little bit closer and you start to, 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 to feel the leaves, you start to, to, to touch the, the bark on the tree, you realize that this thing isn't what it appears to be. It appears as if there is growth, but I don't see any evidence of that growth. It appears that you are saying that you are living one way, but when we really find out the truth, you're living a different way. And what do we call those people? Hypocrites. Do we have any hypocrites here in the church right now? Just point to the person next to you and say, you are a hypocrite. I am too, but not as bad as you, okay? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus re regularly denounced the sin of hypocrisy. Didn't he, didn't he criticize the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? What did he call them? He called them whitewashed tombs. He said, on the, on the outside, you look pristine. You look like you got it going on. But inwardly, you're decaying. Inwardly, you're barren. Inwardly, you're dead. It appears that it looks good. But deep down inside, we all know it's not. One of the biggest hindrances to people coming to the faith or people stepping into the church is because they, they believe that the church is full of hypocrites. I've, always, I've often said it before, like, hey, you think the church is full of hypocrites, right? Like, we got room for one more. You know, somebody make room. We got room for one more. But the truth is, is that all Christians are sinners. That is certain. But not all Christians are hypocrites. And some of you feel like, you are a hypocrite, and you know, and I'm, and I'm speaking to you right now, and you're like, man, I, this is hitting me. But some of you are here and saying, I'm, I'm doing my best to try and live the right way. And I am who I am, off stage, on stage. My family knows it. You know, I, I'm trying to be the right person. So you would say, don't call me a hypocrite. So all Christians are sinners. We know that. But not all Christians are hypocrites. All hypocrites are sinners, but not all sinners are hypocrites. That's, that's, that's very important for, us, for you and I to know. And I think the world has done... Um, a really great job at bashing the church. The world has done a great job of trying to silence the church, trying to shut the church up, trying to not allow the church to do anything. Yet at the same time, the world holds a really high standard of how the church should be when it, when it pertains to righteousness and holiness, right? It's like, you know, we don't care for the church. They did something wrong. Tell the world about it. I can't believe that pastor. I can't believe that minister. I can't believe that adult worker would do those kind of things in church. Oh, now you want to talk about church? Now all of a sudden you're passionate about the church? You weren't 10 minutes ago until you heard this article. That's why I don't go to church. That's not, that's not why you go, don't go to church. But the world decides to pick up on this. And, 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 it, and it hurts us. It hurts us when we see pastors failing. It hurts us as Christians to see other Christians failing. It hurts to see churches closing or doing poor jobs. I think it hurts us all. And we, we get it because we've been there. We've lived in such a way that if I can keep showing up to church, that that will in fact hide what I don't want people to really know. Remember, Jesus is calling out the hypocrisy going on right here. He's saying this tree is basically a hypocrite. It appears like there's growth, but there is no 
there is no growth. And, and, and we're the same way, right? We, we, we appear like we got it all going on. Here's my family. We're smiling, coming to church. Oh, I just can't stand them, you know. I just had the biggest fight in my life, and we're showing them to the front row of church. This is like, you're faking it. And then you'll worship, and you'll sing, and you'll read, and you, you, you're doing this, and you're doing this in hopes to cover up the sin that's really going on in your life that you don't want anybody to know. And if I could just keep showing up, then nobody will ever have to speak to me about it. I don't want to address it. Can I tell you that 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 is what the devil wants you to think. When you come to this place, and and I I trust that VLC is known for this, when you come to this place and you are honest and you are vulnerable and you start speaking what's really going on in your life, this is a place where you can find healing. You can be restored. This isn't a place where we're going to condemn you, kick you out, go bring your issues and problems to some other church. We're going to tell you to bring your problems and issues right here at the feet of Jesus, where you can be restored and you can be healed. That's what the scripture says. How many have experienced that before? You've experienced healing when you started confessing your sins. Isn't that, isn't that the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the church that he's, that he's left here on earth? Is that you can find healing. How do you expect to run back to the cross to receive that forgiveness, to receive that hope, to receive that accountability when you can't address it because we're faking it. We're faking it. I faked it before. You probably have too. I don't want anybody to know what's really going on in my life. And so I'll just act like I got it all going on. And Jesus looks at this tree speaking about the nation of Israel. And he says, if you claim to be God's people, yet you do not bear any fruit for me, I will cut you down. I want you to notice the disciples' reaction when they see the tree that had withered away from its roots. That's what they say in verse 21. Look, it's withered away from its roots. We find that in Matthew's account. Spiritually, the nation of Israel had dried up at its core. Right? It's like they forgot about the foundational things of how this was all established and we got to go back to the core. We may have, you know, a good appearance and a lot of leaves, but at the core it's withering away, it's dying, and we're not really going to last much longer if we decide to build what we're building on something that's not firm. We've got to build it on something that's solid. Warren Wiersbe said we must carefully cultivate our spiritual roots and not settle for leaves. Jesus curses the tree. And what happens next It says in verse 15, on reaching Jerusalem, he enters the temple courts. And he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. How could you you hurt a precious dove, Jesus? (laughs) How dare you? And, And he would not allow anyone to carry any more merchandise through the temple courts. And then he taught them. He says, is it not written that my house will be called a house of prayer for the nations, but you have made it into a, what's he say? A den of robbers. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. They feared him because people were like amazed at his teaching. So he moves on from, from, from cursing this tree to now clearing a temple. Now this wasn't the first time he had cleared a temple. He had come back in his early point in his ministry during his first Passover visit where he clears the temple, but he's got some assistance from a whip. He makes a whip and he starts whipping. I don't know if he's whipping the people or he's whipping the animals, but he's whipping everything out of the temple. He's clearing the temple. And they question him and they say, what, what authority do you have to do this, Jesus? And he says, the temple can be destroyed, but I'll rebuild it in three days. He was really talking about himself. So we see this instance again happening. It was like a temporary clearing. And now there's another clearing taking place at the end of his earthly ministry where he clears, not the temple, I want to make that clear. He's not clearing the temple, he's clearing the temple courts. Let me give you a visual, Aubrey, if you can throw those pictures up on the screen. You'll notice that, I mean, this is a a massive place, right about where that flies at. That's that that outer court right there. Um, We've got, that's that's the court that he's talking about. The middle is where the temple actually would be, but that outer court... I mean, this is, a, this is not just like a little lobby that Jesus shows up and boots one guy out and then flips over a six-foot, you know, folded table. I mean, this is a massive court of Gentiles. This was the court where only the Gentiles could go into. Anybody who was not Jewish 
That was the only place you could go into. It was split up. There was the court of the women, the court of the men, the court of the priests, and the court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles is where Jesus shows up. And this was, this was a chaotic scene, especially during Passover. It was a historian, Josephus, who said that there was approximately 255,000 lambs being sold for sacrificial purposes. So just imagine all of these people buying selling, speaking different languages. I mean, this is a sawgrass mall, guys, right here. What's going on? And now, now throw in a hundred something thousand animals in it. Think about what that would be like. Chaos. And Jesus walks in and he shows up to the temple courts. And here's the thing. This was the court of the Gentiles. This was the place in the temple of God where the Gentiles were to be praying. And what were they doing? They were selling. They were buying. They were coercing with the priests, inflating prices. Up. They, were, they, were, they were price gouging. Yeah, we know anything about that? Yeah, they were price gouging because it's like, oh, you want to get a lamb? You can only get it from here. Now it's this much money. And so all this is going on, and Jesus shows up, and he walks into this place, realizing what it should be, what it's appointed to be, but here's what, he's, here, and, and, but here's what he sees. And he quotes Isaiah, chapter 56, verse 7, when he says, is it not written that my house should be a house of, what's he say? Prayer. What's he saying? Re religiously, it appears that this temple is doing a great thing. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of productivity going on. People making money. Lambs being sold to then be sacrificed as an offering. There's a lot going on that appears to be great. From the distance, it looks good. And this is Herod's temple, by the way. This this is magnificent and great, and it looks good. Until Jesus walks in, and he shows up. They weren't thinking he was going to show up. Like, this guy's not going to show up and do anything crazy. Did you forget that he was whipping people out of here, you know, three years ago? Oh, yeah, I guess so. And he shows up, and he starts flipping tables. He starts kicking people out. And he says, this is my house. You know, I love it on Sunday mornings when I show up here. And people are singing, people are worshiping, people are praising. I mean, I felt like, I don't know, the worship team can, can, you know, say this as well, but I felt like the second service, it was like, it was moving. You know, you feel that, right? It's like everybody's singing, people are shouting, hands are being raised. I can hear it. I can feel it. Like your faith inspires my faith, by the way. Aaron and I were talking the other day about that. Like when, when, when you start operating in that kind of faith, like I know what's going on in your life, yet you're sitting up here worshiping. Like the fact, guys, that the lady who was standing here, Monique, has gone through all the hell that she's gone through, but yet can come up here for the very first time and worship God, that inspires my faith. I'm like, if she can do it, I can do it. And so that inspires us. We're inspired by those kind of things. I love when you, when you pray. I love when you show up on Tuesday nights and some of you are kneeling and praying. I can hear it. I love when you're praying out loud. But sometimes I wonder, and you might wonder that about me, I wonder if all of that is coming from a deep place of depth and intimacy with God or you're just faking it. You're just putting on a show because I have to do it. The pastor's watching me, so I, I got to act like I'm doing it. But there's really no genuine relationship that you've developed with God there's no intimacy that you've developed with God. And so you show up here and you act like you're doing it, but you're actually robbing people of things. You're robbing people of the presence of God. That's why Jesus then goes on to quote Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. He says, you've turned this into a place of, of, of thieves. And he's using the prophet Jeremiah to call out the temple leaders, not just the people, but the temple leaders for abusing their authority. You act like you really care for them. But you don't. And you're abusing them emotionally. You're abusing them you know, financially. You're abusing them spiritually. And so Jeremiah the prophet, who was a bullfrog, calls out you know, these people. And he says, you fools, you hypocrites. Look what you're doing. And look how you're leading these people. And I just wonder if Jesus showed up here today in this church, in these courts, what would he say? What would he say? He, he looked at a tree 
It appeared like it was doing its job, but it wasn't. It wasn't bearing any fruit, and he cursed it. He goes into a temple that appears to be doing its job, but it wasn't, and he clears it. Privately, he shows an object lesson to his disciples, and he takes that private object lesson, and he turns it into a public spectacle. And he says, this is what I want you guys to know, that this is my house. And my house needs to look like my house. My house needs to operate like my house. My house needs to pray like it's my house. It needs to serve like it's my house. It needs to worship like my house should worship. Enough of the fakeness in here. I can't stand it. In fact, you can, you can get out of here. Because my house is going to be a house where we don't act like we got it all going on. We don't act outwardly like we're some pristine individual and we're perfect in our relationship. My house would be a house where people can come and confess their sins and pray and have a genuine relationship with with the Father. This isn't a fake relationship. Don't act like Jesus can see that. Most people can see that, by the way. Most people can see that. Jesus can see it. He says, this is my house. And I need to make it look like my house. Isn't that what he does to you and me? Isn't that what he does to you and I? You know that Paul says to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, he says, do you not know that your body, somebody say my body, are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not of your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Do you not realize that that house lives within you? What kind of house are you building? What kind of house are you showing? What kind of temple are you becoming in here? And does Jesus need to show up in your life and rid yourselves of all the hypocrisy that's going on, all the fakeness, all the phoniness? You say, I don't need it because look what I'm doing. You're just staying busy. But that busyness isn't equating to productivity. You're actually bearing this because you think that your busyness is going to help you. And so you stay busy. You, you, you stay at it. A lot of noise in your life. But deep down inside, you know that if we were to take a magnifying glass and look and to see if there's any fruit that we can enjoy, we wouldn't find any. Does Jesus need to show up in your life today and say it's time to get rid of those things that have not allowed you to bear any fruit? It's time to clear out all that's in your life so that you can start operating how you're supposed to operate. Because the living God is within you and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. That temple is within you. What does Paul say? He says, so honor God with your bodies. If we asked the community around this church right here, if we asked all these neighbors, if we asked the synagogue that's right here, if we asked the churches that are down this street, if we asked them, hey, what do people say about VLC. What do you think about VLC? What would they say? Ah, just another another church. Another church where people can go and check off the box. Another church where people can show up and act like they got it going on. It's another church full of hypocrites. Or would they say, VLC is a church that is doing what it's called to do. They're serving the needs of the families. They're serving the community. They're preaching the gospel. And it's a place that you can actually come and pray and not be judged. Wow. Could you imagine having friends like that (laughs) where you can say whatever you want and share your deepest, darkest moments and they won't judge you? Do you have any friends like that? You 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 need some new friends because that is one of the greatest and purest things that we get to have with our relationship with God is that we can come broken, we can come hurting, We can come wounded. We can come not having all the answers. We could show up on Sunday knowing that we just made the biggest mistake of our life an hour before service. Yeah, we can still come as broken as we are. And what God begins to do is he takes your broken pieces and he meshes them together and he makes something beautiful. You've heard it said all the time, right? God will turn your mess into a message. He'll turn your test into a testimony. Like your darkness, your pain, God will use it. Don't hide it. Don't hide it. Allow allow God to see it. Allow the church to see it. Are we 
following the design that God has for us, are we seeking to honor him? If you are a tree, I don't know what kind of tree you'd want to be. I'd want to be an apple tree, definitely. But if I was a tree, or if I was a temple, and Jesus showed up, and he looked at you, what would he say? What would he need to do? Seriously, if he showed up today, would you still be around the next day? Would you have anything to show for? It's a great question. I don't say that to judge you or condemn you, make you feel guilty. I, the Holy Spirit already does that. I don't need to do it. But I pray that you would ask that question. Say, what do I need to clear out? Because it's way better coming clean than it is getting caught. I don't want to live a life where I'm always getting caught. I want to live a life where I'm coming clean. I want to be the tree. I want to be the temple that goes to God and say, hey, we might not be doing this right. How do I do this right? I want to be going to my spouse saying, hey, I'm, I think I'm failing. How can I do this right? Restoration will take place either way. But man, you could sure save a lot of heartache, right? Amen? By coming clean rather than getting caught. Let me share one more thing. Jesus says, he says, is it written that this place right here is a house of prayer for all nations? That's the word he uses, all nations. Foreigners were excluded from the things that the Jewish people did unless they became Jews. This is why Herod's temple had a place literally for the non-Jewish people. And then there was a, a, a wall of stones that basically said they have signs that we still have today in museums that say no foreigners allowed. No foreigners allowed. You ain't Jewish, you ain't welcome. In fact, if you show up here, you will surely die. That's what it says. And the Jewish people often wondered if this Messiah would show up and would clear the temple of all the foreigners. That'd be a great thing. God, man, I pray that you would just get rid of all the, the sinners in our church. Just get them, send them to some other church. Send all the hypocrites to some other church. I mean, I, I'm sure church people have said that before. And this is what these Jewish people probably are thinking. One day he's going to show up and he's going to rid the temple of all the people that aren't supposed to be here. And Jesus says, my house will be a house of prayer for everybody. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what tongue you speak. It doesn't matter what tribe you're from. It doesn't matter what nation you're from. Jesus would say that everybody is welcome. He was flipping upside down the sacrificial system of the time. Say, you don't just have to be Jewish to come and pray. Everybody is welcome. Everybody is welcome. Paul even says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. He says, for he himself, talking about Jesus, he is our peace, who has made the two groups one. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Church, all are welcome in this house. All are welcome in this house. Turn to the person next to you and say, even you, <laughs> even you. I don't get it, but you, even you. All are welcome to this place. That's why when he died, the, the holy of holies, the, the veil that was, was blocking, the curtain that was blocking was torn in two, giving us access to the Father. And Jesus says, my house is for everybody. Anybody can show up here. Whether you got issues, whether you got sin, whether you got all of these things that you think would disqualify you from showing up to a church. In fact, you probably have said it before. If I show up to that church, I'm going to get struck by lightning. And those sitting next to me probably will get struck by lightning. <laughs> you ever heard somebody say that before? I'm like, just come on in. We die. We all die together. I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? So uh, welcome. Come on. Come on in. In fact, we would say this. Everybody belongs. Everybody belongs. Now, if you don't start changing and God isn't working in you and you start hardening your heart, you ain't going to feel like you belong. But if you come in here and you feel welcomed in here, I think my dad says something like, this is a family, and you could, you could be part of this family. Because we really are a family here. And when you, when you get in, you feel like you belong. It doesn't matter how great you are, how much you know. Some of us know a lot more. Some of you here are thinking, man, I, I could have given this message way better than Jacob. So, and you probably could have. Maybe one week I'll give you. I'll give it to you. You can speak to our children, and I'm just kidding. But, I mean, you're sitting here thinking, I know way more than this guy. We're family. We're here doesn't matter what you know, how little you know, you're welcome. This can be a house where you can find healing, you can find freedom, but you can find salvation. Amen? Would you stand to your feet? Father God, we worship you in this place. We're so thankful for all that you're doing. Would this place, VLC, be known as a house of prayer? 
where your spirit is here. Your spirit is moving. Holy Spirit, we long to see a move of God. Would you open up the heavens, Lord? Do only what you can do. Here we are, surrendering. Do what only you can do.